the podcast for Inquiry, brought to you by the Centre for Inquiry Canada, your community for rational scientific skepticism from a secular humanist perspective. We have questions for today's top answers. I'm your host, Leslie Rosenblatt, board member of the Centre for Inquiry Canada. Welcome. Today I'll be talking with Jonathan Kay. Jonathan is an editor and writer at Quillette, a TEDx speaker, an op-ed columnist at National Post, and host of the Quillette podcast. His work has appeared recently in The Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, Atlantic, Foreign Affairs, Foreign Policy, Skeptic, Canadian Lawyer, and Canadian Jewish News. His books include Among the Truthers, Legacy, How French Canadians Shaped North America, Panics and Persecutions, and the forthcoming Magic in the Dark, One Family's Century of Adventures in the Movie Business. Jonathan and I discuss the media and the state of it in Canada today. We talk about how it has changed over the last 20 years, as well as media concentration and the effects that has had on journalism in the country. We talk about the seemingly endless cuts to journalists and what we have lost in the past 10 to 20 years as a result. We talk about the great promise of the internet and social media and the reality that we face with those technologies today. We talk about the business model of the media today and how journalists can get compensated as well as the government's bailout of traditional media outlets and some of the effects that that has had. And we end today's episode with Jonathan providing some advice for young and aspiring journalists. I'm excited to bring you my conversation with Jonathan Kay. Jonathan Kay, thanks very much for joining us on the podcast for Inquiry. I'm looking forward to our conversation because this is a topic about which I know about as much as the typical Canadian. Okay. Uh, and so uh, I think we're going to be to be learning a lot. Uh, I know that I first came across you probably about 20 years ago, at least your name, uh, when you were a, a columnist at, uh, at the National Post, and then uh, you moved on from there, I believe, on to to be an editor uh, or the editor at the Walrus, yep. and, and then you've uh, recently decided to leave not Canada but Canadian journalism and are uh, at, at uh, like an editor at uh, the Quillette website. It seems like a short time ago, but it's it's actually been four years. Okay, okay, so it's the last four years, so. I'd like to focus on on Canada, but you've you've been involved in the Canadian media landscape for over over twenty years. Uh, can can you tell us what you think have been the most significant developments and changes uh, have been over the course of the last couple decades, and and what how that has how those changes have impacted the industry? So what's interesting is that when I started my journalism career uh, in it was nineteen ninety eight, which is when the National Post started. That's was my first job in journalism. The challenges we thought we had then, they kind of still exist, but there's a, a whole bunch of new challenges. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of them, uh, we've journalists, we've created them ourselves. In the late 90s and the early 2000s, the big challenge everyone was thinking about uh, was, what do we do about the internet? Do we do paywalls? Do we do a subscription service? Um, is, is print still going to exist? Um, or, you know, I mean, there, were, there was a minority of voices that, that actually thought that the internet was kind of a fad and that people really were going to stick with print. Uh, it seems crazy, but 20 years ago, there were some people saying stuff like that. And, and this was a really good question. And, and there are outlets that basically just kind of went out of business because they couldn't answer that question. They couldn't figure out how do we survive? Uh, and what I found was that it was sort of a U-shaped pattern. So at the very low end of the media where you had like kind of gossip sites and sites that relied on, on, on very high volume uh, and delivered I would, what I would say is kind of maybe low value content, uh, they survived just based on volume. And at the very high end, you know, Economist, Wall Street Journal, New Yorker, they survived because they were providing unique content. The outlets that got hit the hardest were sort of like the middle tier, sort of smaller city newspapers. You know, if you worked at the Cleveland Plain Dealer or the Orlando Sent Orlando Sentinel, uh, 
Uh, at one point, I think Seattle lost its newspaper completely. It might still be the case. Um, that They got hit the hardest because the content wasn't good enough to paywall. And it also wasn't gossipy or universal uh, or titillating enough to generate eyeballs around the world. Like, you know, you're not going to get an article that goes viral on the Vancouver Sun website that gets like, you know, 10 million hits from around the world. It's just not that kind of content. And so for, for a long period of time, uh, certainly during, during the 2000s, the big shakeup in the industry was, was about solving that problem or at least reorganizing our industry uh, to, to solve it. And unfortunately, the result was a lot of journalists just left the industry. Um, they went into communications for corporate communications. They worked for political parties. They, a lot of them got jobs at universities or they started teaching journalism or just they got into some completely different field. Um, and so that was kind of the first big wave of, ch of change and challenge that I witnessed. Uh, and then the second big wave came in the form of social media because, uh, I mean, this is a complex conversation, but social media, the most obvious effect was it sucked up all the ad market. Uh, Facebook, Google, I mean, to a much lesser extent, but, you know, Twitter, all of these, these social media networks uh, became, um, they started getting all the ad money, uh, Facebook in particular, um, and, uh, well, Google too. But as a result of that, there was just, the shrinking pie got, got even smaller for media outlets. Uh, and that, that was huge. But it also had a huge effect on the way journalists thought about themselves because social media created this crowdsourced treehouse club where journalists increasingly look to each other for approval or disapproval based on the stuff they wrote. And this created, a, this unfortunately, this, is, this isn't something that, you know, big tech created or this isn't something that, that governments did. It's, it's not because our audience isn't educated enough. It's because journalists themselves became very clubby and it, they started using social media as a way to turn inward and to critique each other and to decide what opinions or what articles or what subjects were valid and which weren't. Um, and that created this whole new kind of challenge, um, not just on the left, also on the right, uh, that, that's completely self-inflicted. Uh, and, that, and we're still dealing with the question of how to solve that problem. Everything that you've mentioned uh, in the last few minutes, you'd like all of the specific examples were for U.S. companies, U.S. cities, U.S. Sure, papers. Yeah. Uh, are the same pressures or the same effects, the same uh, uh, U-shape success rates true in, in Canada? The problem is worse in Canada because everything I've just described, because it's a global phenomenon and because Canada is a small player, within uh, the global meet, the global English. Less than 40 million people in Canada. And within the English, uh, also the French media market, but that's something I know less about, so I'll confine my comments to the English media market. Um, what's interesting is that until fairly recently, uh, members of what I'll call sort of the, the chattering classes, um, especially among progressives, one of their big focuses was how do we, as Canadians, uh, it's cliche, you know, how do we tell our own stories? How do we escape the cultural hegemony of the United States? And the entire monolith of Canadian cultural subsidies, all the alphabet soup of government programs meant to support magazines and movies, um, radio, television, a lot of it is based on the idea that we Canadians are different from the United States. We have a different cultural outlook. outlook. We have to tell these unique stories we have, even, even if that means spending money on it. What happened though, is that social media and not just social media, but also streaming services like Netflix, uh, it just broke down any remaining walls that separated American and Canadian media culture and social media in particular. And you started seeing a lot of journalists say, wait a sec, um, when the articles that I'm writing are, that are going viral, they're not going viral usually because there's Canadian interest. They're going viral because there's clicks from the United States. There's clicks from, from Europe. There's, you know, there's hundreds of millions of English speakers all around the world. And so the professional incentives shifted from, well, what does my domestic print audience want? And by extension, what does my, my editor want? And suddenly it's like, well, you know, 
there's something called chart beat. Uh, this is, it's up on a TV in every every newsroom. You can see which articles are, are are going viral and which aren't. And often the ones that are going viral are are ones that appeal to people in different countries. So as a Canadian journalist, you you now a <laughs> social media is being used by your colleagues to sort of monitor your ideological orthodoxy in terms of your subject and your viewpoint and your language. Uh, and again, this is something that happens with conservatives and and progressives alike. Um, but also you now have this incentive that's completely transnational and that is completely displaced from whatever, wherever your newsroom happens to be located. And, and, and as a result, um, you have Canadian journalists who are much more focused on, uh, what's happening in the United States. I'll give you an example. Uh, this, this, this trial that took place, you know, we're having this conversation in late November, uh, it was just a few days ago, we we heard the verdict in the trial. Um, Kyle Rittenhouse, is that how you, you pronounce his name? Yeah. And he was, uh, he beat the rap. He, he was proclaimed innocent. And this, this, is, <laughs> this is a criminal trial that took place in the United States. It has nothing to do with Canada. But because it dominates English language social media, I just saw all these Canadian journalists and leaders of Canadian political parties release statements on this. Like say, oh my God, I'm, I can't sleep. And I'm so angry at this. And uh, Jagmeet Singh, who's the leader of the NDP here in Canada, very progressive political party for those who are watching or listening from outside Canada, um, he released the statement that like it didn't even mention the fact that this was a trial that was taking place outside Canada. This is something that never would have happened 20 years ago before the audience to which Jagmeet Singh was directing his comments inhabited a completely borderless world of, of English language social media. and and that. Unfortunately, if you're if you're in the United States and you're a journalist, this borderless world of social media is kind of dominated by Americans. So it doesn't feel always so global because so much so much of the stuff they're talking about is American stuff. Anyway, in Canada, it's had an utterly transformative effect because we're a small country that's now suddenly jabbering relentlessly about stuff that happens outside our borders. So historically, uh, particularly with newspapers, they would generate revenue. In, in two main ways. One is this, the small part would be uh, direct subscription revenues. You give them a bit yeah. of money and they, they send a paper your way every day. Uh, and, and the larger part was through advertising in the various sections and the classifieds and so on. Uh, given everything that you've said today uh, with uh, primarily Facebook and Google taking away all the advertising revenue, or at least a vast majority of it, even and before that, Craigslist taking away the uh, uh, the classified ads revenue, and with subscriptions going down because people are accustomed to getting their news online. What is the business model for for well, primarily for papers, but uh, with streamers, as you said, and people watching things on the internet, like the broadcast news, is affected by similar pressures in slightly different ways. Uh, what is the business model for for journalism in Canada today? I know more about the business model for a place like Quillette, which um, is, is not a newspaper. It's an online publication. And we have a very small staff. Uh, and the business model is collection of, of tr there's advertising, but there's also, um, you know, we have a Patreon account. We have investors. Um, we do events live, at least before COVID, well, starting up again, where we uh, promote our brand. We have a podcast. Um, We've actually made a surprising amount of money from from ads from our podcast, which isn't something that I ex expected when I started hosting it. Um, you have to really cast your net wide for for revenue streams, and uh, Quillette makes it work. But it makes it work because we have we have a small staff, like a very small staff. It's it's in the single digits. A traditional newspaper where you have like a sports department and you have printing costs and you have, um, you know, an office building and computers, that it makes it much more challenging, which is why if you look at most newspapers that are considered large newspapers, like the National Post, uh, if you look at their editorial departments are typically like in two digits. It's like maybe mid to high uh, two figures for the number of editorial staff. As recently as the 90s, I mean, I think the Toronto Star and the Globe both had something like three or 400 editorial staff. Uh, the New York Times certainly had well over a thousand editorial staff. 
Um, so, so one of the things that's happened is those numbers have come plummeting down. The high value publications are doing fine. You know, the New York Times in particular has done a really good job of monetizing uh, its electronic product. So has the the Wall Street Journal, um, Washington Post. You know, after you read something like five articles, uh, you have to pay. But that's like zero point one percent of of publications because those are. You know, the highest value uh, English language publications. People go to their site. They're willing to pay money for it. Uh, for for Canadian newspapers, uh, as we've seen, so it's a mit- mix of traditional ads. Like I subscribe to two print newspapers. I subscribe to the National Post and New York Times. And if you open them up, uh, I mean, there are some traditional ads. In fact, now New York Times is full of watch ads because we're approaching Christmas. So uh, <laughs> pages are littered for ads uh, with ads for ten thousand dollar watches. <laughs> Um, so, I mean, that, that market still does exist. Um, there's, there's ads on their website, but these places have had to be much more creative. You know, give you example, the New York times now runs these trips and cruises where for 15 or $20,000, you and your family can go to South America and look at the natural marvels of that continent with science writers. In fact, there was one science writer who got into trouble. He, he actually got fired from the New York times. Uh, a few months back because <laughs> he made a politically uh, controversial comment to one of the teenagers who was on that trip. Uh, and I, I thought it was hilarious because he was there uh, in order to, you know, help the New York Times make money. He was kind of like the eye candy or the ear candy or whatever you want to attract these rich uh, progressive urbanites to come on this trip and give money to the New York Times. And he spoke his mind about something and he lost his job as a result. Um, so, you know, live speaking events like Atlantic magazine partnered with, uh, I think the Aspen Institute and they had this high value speaking series, uh, podcasts, you know, premium memberships. I remember a couple of years ago, Atlantic started this premium membership thing. Um, and then of course in Canada, we also have government subsidies where, uh, I forget the exact figures, but you have major newspapers getting a couple hundred thousand dollars every month. Uh, from the federal government, which is which is troubling. Yeah. So let's let's talk about that. So uh, um, the last year, the the federal government gave sixty million dollars to to be or announced a sixty million dollar program for for legacy media uh, in emergency relief because of, because of COVID, and then another thirty million dollars uh, this year. Yeah. Um, in addition to to various to various other programs, and the rhetoric around this, the justification is that. Uh, in order to have a thriving society, uh, you need journalists, and they're the ones that can off that there are other ones that often uncover things that people in power, uh, both in government and in business, want to want to remain hidden. So a vibrant media is this and is the essential component of healthy democracy. This this is the argument, and they're they're suffering they're suffering greatly. So there's this ninety million dollars plus other government programs to prop up. Uh, 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 media, primarily newspapers, but also radio stations, and I believe uh, TV news. Uh, uh, so is this a good thing to keep journalism alive? Because I think we can all agree that journalism is, is a public good and important to, to society. Or uh, you hinted just a moment ago that it, uh, there might be reasons to be concerned. I think it answers to the same description as, as a lot of government programs, which is uh, the program is good to the extent that the public trusts the intentions of the people controlling the purse strings. And I think because trust is so low uh, in, in government institutions, and this is something not just in Canada, it's, this is a, a phenomenon that's played out, uh, spe- well, especially in the United States, but uh, many European countries, uh, many people simply do not trust the government to be a neutral arbiter, even in the capacity of, of giving money, um, because they think that they're going to put the thumb, their thumb on the scale of either left or right, depending upon the news coverage. And that, uh, I mean, look at the way that people talk about the CBC, especially conservatives. Although, you know, some progressives actually think the CBC is too conservative, uh, but mostly conservatives in Canada, and this has been true for years and years, um, you know, a predictable applause line at a sort of a conservative event is to bash the CBC because you think it's just progressive propaganda. Uh, and <laughs> a lot of days, the CBC does its best to fulfill that stereotype. Uh, it's this content you see on the CBC does not reflect what the majority of Canadians think, unfortunately. Um, and I think actually a lot of the antipathy toward the CBC uh, was just 
applied directly to this program, which was announced a few years ago for subsidy of the legacy media. And by the way, there were some progressive journalists who, who attacked it for a different reason. Like, you know, Jesse Brown, who is this guy, is not a guy I agree with often, but he runs a popular podcast, an outlet called Canada Land. Mm -hmm. Many people watching this, if they're in Canada, will know about it. Um, but he was rightly upset about a program aimed at bankrolling what's arguably an obsolete business model, which is, you know, printing up newspapers and distributing them to people's doors or, or stores if, as if it were still the Cold War period. Uh, whereas, you know, how come that money doesn't go to podcasters or how come that money doesn't go to online outlets? And, and uh, if you look at Toronto, Toronto still has four major newspapers. Um, you know, it has the Toronto Sun, it has Globe Mail, it has the Toronto Star, it has the National Post. You know, name me any other industry where the volume of demand, depending on how you measure it, has over the last 20 or 30 years has kind of gone down, I think something like 75 or 80 percent, yet the number of suppliers remains the same. And one of the reasons it remains the same is because of gov government subsidy. Is that really true? Like where the, the, the supply has been the same? Like it would seem that every every week or at least every month for like the last five years, I, I, I read or I hear uh, a piece about uh, another paper closing or more journalists in a newsroom in a TV station or a radio station or, or a paper somewhere in Canada closing. There were a spate of those stories. Yeah. Uh, or, sorry, being fired, right? Like maybe not the paper closing, but but more journalists are, are being let go. And it just seems that endless wave. I don't want to get into huge examples because there's just so many of them and I don't want to be leaving out some. Yeah. No, no, you're absolutely true. And my, my comments were oriented toward the, um, on the corporate side, where in, in terms of the corporate entities, in terms of the, the actual newspaper brands that are serving people, mm -hmm. uh, this is an industry that should have consolidated more than it already has um, and, and, and would have consolidated more if it weren't for some of the subsidies that are available. What you're saying about journalists themselves is absolutely true. And there's, there's a, a graph that shows, uh, people can Google it, it shows the number of journalists who are employed as, as full-time editorial, like what you and I would call journalists, like they're editors or they're writers, um, they work for newspapers, uh, TV stations or radio stations, you know, doing news or um, editorial functions uh, in the press. And then the other line on the graph shows uh, communications professional professionals, PR professionals, uh, people who work for government or academia or corporations as professional comms staffers. And if you see the lines are going in completely different directions and you know, depending on how you measure it, a couple of years ago, the lines crossed each other. And and you see this, and I see this in the stories I cover. I'll give you an indication. So a lot of the stories that I, I deal with uh, involve higher education. So I'll, I'll be doing a story about an academic scandal uh, at a Canadian university and, or, or even, you know, a small American college. You'll be doing a story on a relatively small college or school or <laughs> even sometimes like a large high school. Mm -hmm. And they'll have like this whole staff of marketing and communications people. And you look like, I, was, I think I was doing a story I was on, on Brock, Brock University here. And like, they have this very well-staffed communications department. Uh, they have this very slick publication called Brock News. And the, the staff at a place like Brock, which in one way or another is tasked with promoting the Brock brand mm -hmm. is actually larger than most of the regional media outlets that are supposedly covering Brock. And this is true of a lot of small markets. Uh, I mean, even here in Ontario, like the University of Toronto just has like, dozens of people who in one way or another are involved with promoting the University of Toronto brand. And a lot of these people aren't academics. They're people with MBA backgrounds or communications backgrounds. They're essentially traditional corporate spin people. And they now outnumber the journalists who are running the education beat that are supposed to be covering this thing. So this, as a result, the stories that get published often are just press releases in editorial form. Like, what are the effects of that? What, what isn't being reported on because of the, of the decline of the number of journalists? I know that in the American context, what a lot of journalists there have said, 
and which I find very credible, is that there are still a lot of people doing good investigative reporting at the national level. Because in a country of, I don't know, almost 400 million people, you're always going to find interest and financing uh, for, for investigating the national government. What I have heard, and I, I imagine something is, is analogous for Canada, is that the real breakdown in investigative coverage takes place at the local level. And so the example that's often given is the Miami Herald, which uh, it's, it, Miami Herald's legacy is one of the great local investigative newspapers in the United States. Uh, and at, at an earlier iteration had, you know, just dozens of people who were staffed to the job of, of, of finding out a lot of the stuff that was going on at city hall and in uh, state agencies. And, and they won, they've won numerous awards for that kind of coverage. State level and city level investigative reporting, a lot of that has dried up because if you're doing investigative reporting for 400, a country of 400 million people, yeah, you can sustain that. If you're doing it for a city of a couple million or a couple hundred thousand, or even for a state of that population, you're not going to be able to sustain it. So many scandals take place at that level, at a more amateurish level of expenditure and politics. And again, we don't know what we don't know, but that is really where there's been a huge black hole because you now have whole communities that basically their only source of local news is is like Facebook chat groups, like whole counties in the United States. That that's that's their news. It comes from social media because a certain percentage of of politicians and a certain percentage of business folks are going to be corrupt. That always has been the case. Uh, before there was a chance that they would be that they would be found out, and now. Like those investigations aren't happening. So there's a lot more, there may not be a lot more sleaze happening, but there's a lot more sleaze that's that's happening that's not being investigated, not being reported on and not being caught. I'm a profiteer of this phenomenon because uh, a lot of the the scoops that I've gotten in the last year or two, um, a lot of like sort of the unique stories I've been able to report come from people in Canada who come to me with scoops. They come to me with documents. They come to me with recordings. A lot of these, by the way, involve... They happen to involve education, but not that's not it. They come to me because they don't, they they haven't gotten callbacks from people who work at Canadian outlets. I, I work for uh, an Australian outlet. Um, a lot of people don't know that Quillette is Australian because we we run a lot of articles about Europe and, and Canada, and the United States. Um, but <laughs> I, I I find it shocking that sometimes I end up with these scoops because there aren't beat reporters at Canadian newspapers. Who, who are tasked with what used to be like pretty clear areas of journalistic coverage, education, uh, you know, this or that aspect of government, um, you know, certain, you know, health policy, stuff like that. There are, beat reporting has really dried up. A lot of reporters who survive are just general assignment reporters. And so they're just kind of following whatever happens to be trending that day. They're not, they're not specialists in a given area. And so some, sometimes people have things that are explosive documents and, and great stories, they're not getting callbacks from, from Canadian reporters, or they just don't know any Canadian reporters because they don't subscribe to their local newspapers. They don't, they're, you know, they're not interested in it because it's, you know, the content is thin. And so my phone rings and, or, well, it doesn't literally ring. What happens is people typically send me DMs on Twitter <laughs> or email me and, and they're emailing me these, like, like some of the stories Quillette has broken on Canada, which, you know, have gotten hundreds of thousands of hits and just like um, huge stories. The shocking things about those stories is that we were able to get them. We're a small outlet, um, but people know, A, that, that we're interested. B, when we report the story, we're going to report the hell out of it because, you know, we have a track record on that. But also that we don't have ideological barriers that some newsrooms have. Uh, you know, the story I did, again, we're having this conversation late, late November, a guy came to me with some pretty explosive documents about a union in Halton District, which is, is west of Toronto. Uh, I mean, these are these are documents that like five or ten, even five years ago, there would have been like three or four newspapers just climbing over each other to get these documents. Um, guy couldn't get callbacks from newspapers because like, you know, he couldn't find people who, who specialize in that area. And so we ended up with the scoop. Now, and then, you know, after a whole bunch of Canadian newspapers reported it after we reported it, um, or I reported it on social media. Um, but this just wouldn't have happened five or 10 years ago. Like, 
If people had a scoop, there were reporters who would call them back on it. A few minutes ago, you commented that there was some consolidation of ownership in Canadian media, but not enough. And I certainly agree with your observation that there's, you know, a few corporate entities that are, you know, buying up more and more media properties in, a, in an overall shrinking market. Do you think that this effect that uh, that you've just commented on about people not getting a, a callback, whether it's due to massive layoffs of journalists or ideological boundaries within a particular institution, now that there are fewer media institutions, uh, do you think that might be part of the cause for that? And you mentioned that the, that the consolidation was not sufficient. Do you think that if there was greater consolidation in, uh, in Canadian media, that that would, that would help things or might it further hinder things? It's it's hard to say because there's there's several different phenomena phenomena going going on. One of them is that, as I say, you you have a lot of very marginal corporate entities that, in in a more rational economic landscape, would have would have consolidated or merged or um, streamlined the overall structure of the industry um, many years ago. But they and but this is a complex story. Like you know, Toronto Star was owned by a, a sort of a, a white shoe, very wealthy family for for a long time, and um, Globe and Mail also traced its ownership to like you know very deep pockets. National Post was started by Conrad Black, and there are ideal ideological differences between all these papers. So it, it's a complicated story to tell. But yes, I would say that if if the newspaper industry were like other industries, it, it would have consolidated. However, there's this other process that I alluded to earlier, which is a sort of ideological consolidation, where uh, when, I, when I started in, in the newspaper industry, the idea was I work for a newspaper X, you work for newspaper Y, I'm trying to get the scoop, I'm trying to go to press with a story before you. We defined our teams or our tribes in a more corporate way. Um, this is like a traditional sort of 20th century way of, of viewing the newspaper wars where you're competing for stories and the people in your trench, so to speak, are people who share your corporate uh, domain. And then what happened, social media blurred that line because suddenly you had people at one newspaper attacking people at the same newspaper for ideological, perceived ideological lapses. You saw this at the New York Times with James Bennett being thrown out of his op-ed job, basically by people within his own newspaper. Uh, the Vancouver Sun lost its op-ed editor two years ago uh, for similar reasons. And, you know, uh, Barry Weiss of the New York Times, uh, she left because she couldn't handle not the abuse she was getting online from strangers, but the abuse she was getting from people who once were her friends and proud colleagues at the New York Times newsroom. And so as a result, you get this ideological monoculture among many people within the industry that that it's no longer siloed within uh, corporate entities. And there's pressure for reporters, no matter which publication they're at, or if they're the CBC or CTV, to all pretty much take their marching orders from this like sort of groupthink, crowdsourced social media um, silo in which in which they all exist, regardless of what company they work for. I find that fascinating because uh, as someone who's not involved with media, yeah. you know, you're, you're talking about behind the scenes, but you know, if it's, I'm not really, it's, about... it's out there on Twitter. I mean, just, you know, I know people who work in say, uh, say accounting or uh, the construction industry or something like that. Mm -hmm. In these industries, you would never get a guy who worked at one accounting firm going on Twitter and saying, Oh man, I just saw the numbers from Deloitte and man, what a bunch of, what a bunch of jerks those guys are. Like it would be seen as completely weird and unprofessional if people in like accounting or, you know, <laughs> take your pick of any normal industry that actually makes money. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, a guy who works at an electronics manufacturer or like he doesn't just wouldn't just go on social media and <laughs> start randomly slagging off some guy at a competitor. It would be seen as weird behavior, but this kind of behavior is like, strangely normal for journalism where you get people who are fairly prominent at like places like the New Yorker or Washington Post or New York Times just like going off in public forums and denouncing sometimes their own colleagues um, in, in, in often deeply personal ways. 
Okay, so these are not these are not critiques. You, you'll have to excuse me. I, I, as I said, no. I'm a, I, I consider myself a typical Canadian media consumer, which means that I don't sure. follow uh, the, you know, the Twitter wars. And uh, good for you. They're toxic and and juvenile. Is journalist A slagging journalist B because it was poorly reported, because the sourcing wasn't there, the you know, you drew conclusions that were not warranted by the data, or is it you are endorsing a political view or or you you were not sufficiently critical of someone that I don't like? And like what what are the nature of of the criticisms? Like if someone loses their job because they they violated journalistic standards, like isn't that a good thing? But I don't, but, but you know, you, when you said that people were, were forced out, you weren't, per, you weren't specific on what the offense was beyond that other people didn't like it. So I'm just, I'm curious because I yeah. don't know. Right. So a lot of this comes down to ideological tribalism. So think of people arguing about uh, hockey teams. Toronto Maple Leafs and the Montreal Canadiens. Which, by the way, is some of the most vicious s- s- trolling and stuff that goes on, on on social media. Often it is in these subcultures of sports. But I'll give you a very specific example. So there's a guy okay. who I deep, deeply respect. Um, his name is Jesse Single. His last name is spelled S-I-N-G-A-L. He's uh, released a book in, uh, fairly recently on uh, the replicability of peer-reviewed studies. He has written for the Atlantic. He's written for New York magazine. He's, he's written for, he just reviewed a book, uh, in the New York times book review. He's like a great journalist and, and well-known. Uh, I think he lives in Brooklyn. I've met him. I've interviewed him on my podcast. Um, and I think it was about a week or two ago, there was a guy, former editor at New York magazine, who's not at New York Magazine anymore, who went on social media and and, uh, accused Jesse publicly of saying, I forget the exact wording, but it was basically saying, like, you carry water for conservatives, but, you know, you've betrayed liberals because you're not adequately scathing in your denunciation of conservatives. Basically saying, like, you know, you're not on the side of angels, you're you're on the side of Sauron and Darth Vader. (laughs) And and Jesse, Jesse... I mean, all these things are public. That's what makes all this so mortifying. Jesse replied, and Jesse has a huge social media following of his own, so he's not exactly defenseless in these arguments. Jesse replied, he said, you were my editor for three years at New York Magazine. You know, this was the guy to whom Jesse would pitch articles. They'd they'd have discussions. This guy knew Jesse well. They were colleagues. Mm -hmm. And he's saying, do do you really think that's, that's a fair assessment of my worldview? And it's it's a it's a cutting thing for Jesse to say because it also sends people to the New York Magazine website where they can see all the journalism that Jesse has produced, and 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 by the way, what this guy said was complete nonsense about Jesse. And but the guy then replied publicly to this rebuke and said, "Yes, I do think it's fair." I forget the, the wording, but it's hard to really say what this argument about is about, except somebody rising to their feet in like a church and saying, you are not pious enough. Uh, You may kneel, but I kneel lower than you. It really doesn't go beyond that kind of tribalization on on the basis of of perceived ideological purity. And and a lot of this happened because of Trump, right? Because Trump caused a kind of social panic. I mean, I'm no Trump fan. I think Trump was was, uh, nauseating, but... um, I saw just among in, in my peer group because I, I, you know, I went to a very progressive law school and a lot of my friends are graduates there and, and are highly progressive. And you could see that when when Trump became president, it was like there's something wrong with the world. We have, you know, our, our 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 country has become contaminated with this evil presence. And everyone sort of became like an exorcist where, the, you know, they had to go to their friends and their book clubs and their workplaces and and kind of sniff out anybody who reflected this kind of contaminant uh, and and the these arguments I'm describing on social media among journalists is a vestige of that it's a really unhealthy reflex and none of this has anything to do with like government or big brother I, you know I hear people denounce wokeism and cancel culture and they say oh it's like big brother I'm like, no, in many ways, it's the opposite of Big Brother. Big Brother was about a monolith controlling what everybody could think or say. Journalists are doing this to each other. This is crowdsourced. 
uh, Big Brother would be horrified by this. He'd say, you know, there's, there's, no, <laughs> there's no logic to this. Where's the Ministry of Truth? Uh, it's completely decentralized. And um, so in, in many ways, this goes back to a question we talked about earlier, the, the threats to, so, to the media. This is not something anybody first saw 20 years ago. We, we, even when, when conservatives wrote about censorship, they, they assumed it was coming from government or some other totalizing authority, sort of this top-down thing, human rights commissions and all that sort of thing. Uh, that's not the big threat. The big threat is, is what we're doing to each other. It's crowdsourced. Let's follow that a little bit further, and and, and I want to draw in draw on what you mentioned earlier about uh, levels of trust being very yeah. low, particularly towards previously authoritative uh, bodies such as such as government. Uh, like from uh, you know the great promise of the internet and social media, not necessarily from a media perspective, uh, but. Uh, but that was that everyone could act, have access to a publishing platform, and their and their voice would be you know equal to others. So there wouldn't be that kind right. of you know censorship or, or or filtering. And the greatest issue I think with uh, the internet and social media is that everyone has access to a publishing platform, and their voice is equal to everyone yeah. else's. And so, how can an average Canadian um, you know, like distinguish between reliably sourced, well investigated? backed up, documented journalism versus the spin, lies, or propaganda that apparently now outnumber the journalists in, in Canada? Is, is, is What tools do we have to try and actually understand what is happening in, in the world and in, and in Canada? Yeah, I'm, I'm very skeptical that there's a systematic answer to that that says, well, you know, here, here is what you should be doing. Obviously, aside from trusting everything that I read on Colette, but beyond yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I think a lot of it starts with making sure you're not in an ideological silo. So one pattern you often see among people who are radicalized on the right or the left is they will start subscribing to, say, an email list, or they'll go kind of deep into their brother-in-law's uh, Facebook page. Or It doesn't even have to be an out-and-out -out conspiracism. It could just be like a high, highly radicalized, ideologically torqued uh, subculture. And one of the centrifugal effects of, of electronic media is the suggestion function. So if you're on YouTube and you're looking at a video that's like, you know, why Trump is awesome, the suggested videos are all going to be you know, why Trump is awesome part two or why Trump is better than awesome or like you, you go down the rabbit hole because the technology leads you down the rabbit hole. It doesn't mean that YouTube is for people who love Trump. If you were watching videos about how horrible Trump is, the suggested videos would all be, you know, about pu pushing you further down that. And the same is true. So what I found, for instance, is that like friends of mine who have gone deep into, say, opposing the idea of anthropogenic climate change. They're some of the same people who now refuse to get vaccinated because some of the same electronic fora in which people have propagandized against the idea that anthrop anthropogenic climate change is reality. Guess what? Those are the same forums where there's all these people saying, hey, you know, vaccines will sterilize you or, um, you know, you're more likely to die if you get vaccinated. If you're not going to trust scientists about climate change. Why would you trust scientists about vaccines? Right. And sci scientifically, there's, there's no, there's no um, correspondence between virology and climatology. Like they're very different scientific disciplines, but culturally they're not. They're culturally adjacent in the sense that they're both about the idea of a group of scientific elites in cahoots with a group of activists and political elites who are trying to impose some nefarious agenda on people. And I got to say, you know, maybe five or 10 years ago, I would have said, well, if you do have the time, go to the source and go to places like JAMA, you know, uh, Journal of the American Medical Association, or it's equivalent, you know, the Lancet. Uh, if, if you feel like you can read peer reviewed articles on, um, on this kind of subject, I'm, I'm a lot less skeptical of that now because even, and this is on the other side of the political spectrum, you know, I've been bashing conservatives and I'll bash progressives a little bit. You have a lot of these um, peer reviewed scientific publications that especially in the last couple of years have peddled their own kind of mythology and have published ostensibly scientific articles about how like biological sex is this myth, this colonial construct and, um, you know, tracing very dubious arguments about um, 
how racism and colonialism are like the real diseases in our society, uh, the, the Canadian government, the CIHR, here in, it's this grant, grant giving government agency here in Canada just gave $1.2 million to a Canadian university that is treating cancer as a symptom of colonialism and is looking to basically traditional placebo medicine as a way to, um, to, to solve some of the challenges of oncology. I mean, it's just complete bad crap but it's ideologically approved bad crap. And you actually had Patty Heyju, who's the former health minister and is still in Justin Trudeau's cabinet, tweeting out how proud she is of sending this money down the toilet. This is this is news to me. Yeah, Lakehead University. Something that I have read is that uh, pollution, like cancer, carcinogenic pollu- pollutants are far more common in uh, in poor neighborhoods and those in indigenous sure. areas and those Absol- with that's absolutely minorities. True. Yeah. And which means that they are far more likely to develop cancer because they're in more highly polluted areas because we've chosen to build uh, factories and then or, and then not enforce emission standards as as strongly. Well, polluted drinking water, mercury poisoning, yeah, all these things. These are real. So in that sense, you know, uh, cancer as a form of of colonialism or of racism makes sense because of these very real phenomenon. Or is that not the focus of of the study? <laughs> Look, I, mean, I don't know. I'm just yeah. I, I, I'm trying to I'm trying to understand what might be a, a reasonable sure. uh, explanation, because the way you posited it did sound ridiculous. And I'm wondering, was it that ridiculous or what, is there is there something a little bit deeper that might be? No, there's nothing deeper. And, and I invite okay. anybody listening to this uh, to Google uh, Lakehead University. Um, One point two million dollars is traditional healing. And of course, this goes back to what we were talking about earlier is like a lot of the, to the extent this is reported, it's reported in the uh, rhapsodic language of, of the press release that was created by Lakehead University, which uh, of course the government was only too happy to signal boost. Uh, no, it's all about traditional healing and the evils of colonialism and you know the traditional ways of the elders and all this stuff. It's 100% absolutely true that Marginalized communities, they always get the crappiest land, mercury poisoning, uh, lack of uh, sanitary drinking water. There's always dozens of reserves in Canada that at any one, one time, if you can't get clean drinking water, think of all the diseases that, that you can get. You know, Walkerton, Ontario, that wasn't an, an indigenous issue, but this was, this was 20 years ago. You had, uh, God, what was it, like a dozen people, close to a dozen people who died from E. coli from drinking water. That's right. Yep. If the CIHR were in the business of funding metaphors, the metaphorical idea that racism causes cancer, I guess that's as good a metaphor as anything else. Um, you know, in the same way that you could say racism uh, causes back pain or racism shortens longevity or colonialism leads to, um, you know, dying of, of COVID because you have poor medical care or you don't have a medical clinic. Like all of these things are going concerns as metaphors, but the CIHR is not in the business of funding metaphors. It's in the business of funding actual scientific research, which ultimately what causes cancer, you know, the, the, the vectors of, of these cancers, it's not colonialism or racism, unless, you know, if you're writing a poem or you're teaching a post-colonial studies class, okay, I'll give you a pass on that. You know, you could use these as, as, as grand sweeping metaphors, uh, or sociological explanations, and there's a grain of truth to them, but <laughs> that's not what scientific studies are supposed to be looking at. They're supposed to be looking at things like, uh, you know, how can we change, you know, very specific drug regimens or behavior regimens or aspects of diet, uh, and you know, the bridge words often are like, well, you know, we have all these traditional healing and traditional medicine, like. Traditional medicine is medicine that hasn't passed peer review. And once it passes peer review, it's not traditional medicine. It's medicine. There are plenty of medicines that save lives every day that started out as traditional medicine. And I'm prepared to accept that, you know, across Canada on indigenous reserves, there's there, there may be untold quantities of herbs and practices that one day may be incorporated into, into our scientific understanding of medicine. This, this is how many medicines started out. But until that happened, you can't get around the <laughs> the the rigors of of the scientific method uh, 
by just vaguely saying, well, you know, we're no longer studying traditional oncology. We're just studying the evils of colonialism. Right. It's just a waste of money. Without studying them, we don't know which traditional practices are extremely effective, which are essentially placebos and which might might actually be harmful. I'll take traditional medicine if it passes peer review and makes me healthier. I don't care if it's traditional or non-traditional. Like, but again, of course, yes, exactly. That's what once. I mean. But but we have to, we have to we have to study it. We need to right. know, right? Yeah. We, 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 to, to learn. All right, I'm going to I'm going to do something, and I promise only to do this the once. I'm going to quote I'm going to quote you. Oh no, that's. <laughs> How unsporting. Yeah. So here, here's the quotation. I can attest from personal experience that newspaper opinion columnists and editorial writers increasingly are being instructed to lay off certain companies and industries, the ones that still pay for advertisements. 100%. Now, the pressure, the pressure to stifle criticism of advertisers uh, was always there, like right from the start, because as we discussed uh, towards the beginning, you know, even from the first newspapers, the majority of the income st- income stream came from advertisers. Yep. So the pressure has always been there. That so, how did newspapers avoid that conflict of interest in the past? They never did. No, no, they never did. Okay, so then what has changed that caused you to write that? Like, I'm assuming that you you wrote about a change, or was that so, was no, it no. just well, one of the reasons that I, I could have wrote written those words, which sound very eloquent and well-expressed, so no surprise that I wrote them. I'm (laughs) I'm a big fan of my own. So what I have tried to emphasize to to conservatives, because you often hear like conservatives waxing nostalgic for the days when reporters would just write the truth as they saw it, and there were no strictures, uh, everything was pure. Like this is this is a psychological impulse that exists in a lot of political movements, left and right. The idea that like there used to be some golden period that we have to revert to. The good old days. Yeah, you know, I'm in my early fifties, but even that's old enough to remember when, as an editorial writer, you had to keep in mind that a certain airline and an airline, because I'm not going to say the name of the airline, but there was an airline. When I was an editorial writer, we could not criticize this airline. And uh, I, I remember sitting next to the people who sat at the auto section, so automobiles um, at the National Post. And they were actually very hardworking journalists. They, they produced like an eight or 12 page section every week with dozens of articles. And there were only like two or three of them. Uh, very hardworking journalists. But at the time, at least, the major automakers were huge buyers of ads. So, you know, if you test drive the latest Toyota Camry and the headline is another piece of junk from the idiots of Toyota, that's probably like something you that will be a career limiting move for you and will be an advertisement limiting move for your colleagues who are trying to sell ads to Toyota. And that's why I invite people to read, to the extent they still exist, like the weekend sections that are devoted to, you know, they're called Gears or, you know, Driver's Edge or whatever. Like most of the reviews of automobiles are (laughs) really positive, you know, another winner from Toyota. Mm -hmm. You know, you thought the Camry couldn't get better. You were wrong. Like, because, because it's not like you're looking at those sections and the ads are from the Canadian Wildlife Foundation. Like the ads are, are from, from automakers. So, uh, and, and that, that's always existed. Uh, and it wasn't just that, like, I, I've spoken about this publicly, but uh, at one, the National Post has gone through a lot of different phases of ownership and control. And there was one guy who was our big boss, who was like, v- nice guy, very politically well connected. I respect him a lot. But because he was so influential and well respected, he sat like on a lot of boards, um, you know, government agencies, and uh, as a result, those agencies became very difficult to criticize because it was sort of like, well, if you're criticizing this agency, someone would say, wow, you know that like our boss, you know, is hosting their Christmas party. Um, and, and it didn't even really have anything to do with money because it, it's not like this, you know, this particular agency was, was buying ads in our, our paper. It was more of like, just kind of like a personal thing. And, and I used to joke that, if there's an, you know, <laughs> if if there's an agency connected to the government and you recognize the acronym, chances are it's going to be challenging to criticize it because this particular guy, again, I mean, he's it's because he was famous and successful and everyone wanted him on their boards and as an advisor and stuff like that. Like he was just 
he was a powerful guy and he was connected to this, all these, these entities, it became tricky to criticize them. One very interesting, so there's a book that I actually should have had it on my desk so I could, I could bring it up to the camera, uh, written by a Newsweek editor. It just came out. It's, it's addresses a lot of these problems in the American media in particular. And she talks about how the fact that I think it was like maybe 75 years ago or a hundred years ago, only something like 25% of journalists had college degrees. It was like being a plumber or it was like being, um, you know, a cop or actually most policemen in Canada at least have university degrees now, but it was like, it was, you were a hack. It was a trade. You didn't see yourself as a member mm -hmm. of a priestly class. And as a result, a lot, even the people sometimes in the editorial offices, you know, the, the corner office, the editor in chief, you know, remember Spider-Man, J Jonah Jameson, like the, the big boss, the, the cigar chomping guy. I did. But he was an everyman. Like he was seen as a kind of like jumped up version of a bartender or something like that. Like his personality and, and this, especially places like the New York Post where there were like these, you know, Jimmy Breslin and stuff like that. It, the, these were people who were seen as very much in touch with, with the everyman. Uh, and, and then that started changing in the last part of the 20th century. David Brooks has written about this, where suddenly journalists, it became a kind of professional calling, like being an accountant or, uh, and you saw a lot of Ivy League folks. In, in this book, they talk about how Watergate really changed things. Because when people saw uh, Robert Redford in the role of like taking down Richard Nixon in the movie version, mm -hmm. movie version, um, yep. it was like, wow, I want to do that. And it wasn't just for, for, uh, for hacks. Suddenly it became like this sort of noble thing to do. And as a result, you're getting a lot of people who their interest, even though they're journalists, their social and personal and professional interests got tied up with things like charity boards and things like, you know, sitting on committees or becoming associate professors, teaching a class in journalism at the local college. And they became local grandees. And this is a particular problem in Toronto where everyone's going to, you know, it's the same bunch of people going to everyone else's dinner parties. Uh, and as much as the direct corporate money that goes into advertisements, this more indirect form of self-censorship on the basis of, of social and professional relationships and, and the feeling that you're betraying your social class, mm -hmm. that is at least as much of a problem that you see. And, and, and that's been true. That's been true for decades or has that, got, has that gotten worse recently? Always. It's always been true. So, so what you wrote was an observation or rather more of a lamentation rather than a, uh, an observation of something new. So a hundred years ago when you had, you know, Upton Sinclair and you had like the muckrackers or maybe more than a century ago, the social class of journalists might've felt like they were betraying was sort of like the man on the street. Um, now, if you read editorial copy of the Toronto star, or if you look at the editorial decisions, not just Toronto star, I don't want to beat up on them, but a lot of it is like it's upper middle class, bien pensant people who are very concerned about the opinions of other and pensant upper middle class people who live in Toronto or Vancouver or Montreal, they're all in the same Facebook groups and Twitter chats. And to a certain extent, their, their choices are like, how is this editorial decision going to make me look vis-a-vis -vis these people whose opinion I care about? And a lot of it is class-based. Um, it was always thus, but as I say, you know, in the last 50 years, that class has shifted upward. The chattering classes have become more chattering, more elevated socioeconomically, and more insulated from, from people who aren't in their socioeconomic stratum. Um, it's, they're, they're, they're detached. And that, that a, lot, a lot of that is the, sub, is the reason there's so much distrust. If you're watching the CBC, and it just seems to be kind of woke stuff that caters to college profs and activists, it's not so much that you disagree in substance with a lot of the stuff they're doing, but if the language they're using, you know, the acronyms, the sort of progressive uh, buzzwords and stuff, if it seems to be this sort of clubhouse idiom that's for people of a certain background and that they're, they seem to not like people like you or they're talking down to you, that's a lot of the distrust is just based on 
feeling alienated by this the social sphere that that deliberately seeking to exclude you. So Jonathan, I could probably do this all day because I'm finding this fascinating and I'm learning a lot and I want to thank you. We've been talking for about an hour so I want to ask one one more question. It's a big one so it might feel free to to expound at length but how can journalism particularly in Canada in your opinion survive on an ongoing basis? Now I've heard lots of ideas thrown about whether it's like individuals blogging about city hall and asking for one time or monthly donations. Uh, I think that's essentially the Substack model, but writ small. Um, uh, there's independent digital media companies and brands like Rabble or the Taiyi or, or Canada Land, which you yeah. uh, which you mentioned before. There's allowing media companies to incorporate as nonprofits or as as charities. Uh, what what do you suggest would be good, and and what do you think will happen? So look, as much as I love Quillette, um, I. I... Outlets like Quillette in the long run can't be the only part of the solution. If for the same reason that Substack can't be the only part of the solution. I, I think it's great that a million people are writing their own truth, but there are some stories that you absolutely need a big media organization to report properly because of just old fashioned considerations, fact checking, legal support. You know, I, I personally have come across stories that were leaked to me that I, I have told the person, I say, I, I can I can put this in the hands of people in the traditional media who will be able to report the story, but I can't report the story because the, reporting the story properly would take me two months uh, and it would take legal indemnification of, of a type that just, it, it would be impossible to, to predictably ensure for a small outlet like mine. And so you're always going to need a place like the CBC or the National Post or the New York Times or their equivalents in other jurisdictions that have lawyers, that have professional um, veteran journalists who who can sniff out BS from non-BS and know what a, what a real story is. Because sometimes a lot of the reason people don't like, you know, Substack, you know, everything, everything is, is reported breathlessly. And legacy media one of their editing functions is telling people this is a real story this is not a, a big story one of the reasons i subscribe to the new york times is despite all my criticism of the new york times i still respect their editorial judgment about what should be on page a1 and what should be on page a20 that still means something to me i'm old-fashioned that way and and you that kind of expertise you're not going to get that expertise from substack or uh or social media because on substack or social media everything is on the front page you know, if you have a Substack and you're writing one story a week, that's your front page. Like that's the most important thing in the world to you. Whereas the generalized media, general interest media, part of their sorting function is telling you what's important. And you trust, at least to a certain extent, that they're fearless because, well, if someone sues them, they have lawyers. Uh, and if someone says, oh, you got all your facts wrong, they, they have fact checkers. And so that we need that kind of thing. I don't care if it's called the CBC. I don't care if it's called the National Post. I don't care if it's called the New York Times. 50 years from now, there's got to be something like that. My view on how that survives, I'm very skeptical of a government funding model. Um, I think that NPR historically is as good an example as, as any. BBC has also, it has a spotty record lately, but then you get to the Washington Post. Like it or not, the Washington Post is owned by a super rich guy. And more and more, I think, unfortunately, the state of our media if you don't, you got to pick your poison. If you don't like putting your trust in big government, giving subsidies to media, it's got to be, well, I guess Jeff Bezos, you know, Washington Post, you're putting your trust in like a, one, one super rich guy, which we already kind of do when we go on Twitter. It's like, you know, Jack Dorsey. Uh, we go on Facebook. We're kind of putting our faith in terms of the, con the integrity of the content. We're putting it on, on Zuckerberg. So, I'm not sure I see an alternative to either very wealthy entities or individuals um, kind of extending their largesse to to these outlets and, and, and bankrolling them and controlling them. It's either going to be them or it's going to be government. It's probably going to be a mix of the two. Unfortunately, in both cases, it gives people well-founded reasons to express distrust. So I don't know how to, how to answer your question in a way that ensures that journalism will be well financed and also that we'll be able to trust the contents. It's going to continue to be a balancing act between those two.
Well, hopefully uh, somebody can come up with a, a magic elixir. <laughs> There's a lot of experimentation going on and hopefully hopefully we'll be able to figure something out. All right. Any any last thoughts, Jonathan? I want to thank you very much for your time. So if there's anybody watching this and they're young and they want to go into journalism, you shouldn't do it. And it's really dumb and you should pick another field. <laughs> OK. On that note. And I, by the way, I tell, that, I tell that to people. I say I do know because they still have journalism schools and I, I don't. I'm saying it as a joke, but when 23-year-olds say, oh, should I go into journalism? I say, absolutely fucking not. Um, you're not going to make a lot of money. The people who should go into journalism are people who have something else they can do for money that they enjoy doing, and they, they see a way to go into journalism diagonally or sideways. They've already learned a useful and lucrative skill and, you know, somebody's asked them, can you help with a blog or they do freelance stories or maybe the videographer or something like that. Take a step into it, see if it agrees with you, but make sure there's something else in life that you can do to make money uh, that doesn't involve putting words on the screen or words on paper. Because if that's the only way you can make a living and the journalism thing doesn't work out, you're going to become like assistant marketing manager for a local college or some company. And unless that's what you want to do for a living going into journalism isn't going to to get you where where you want to go so i i would urge wariness on the part of any young person who wants to go into this field it's in flux there's not a lot of job security don't make a lot of money it has all the problems that i've been describing i got very lucky i've been able to make a career out of it i'm i'm statistically it's i'm not representative of my field so be warned, anybody who, although actually, given what I've said, it's not likely anybody would be inspired, just the opposite. They probably, if they're still listening, they're probably disgusted with the state of the field that I've described. But to the extent that they are not turned off journalism, I would urge additional war wariness because of all the problems I've described. Well, that, that bodes ill for a vibrant media in 10 to 20 years. Who knew? I mean, by the way, who you know, also, who can predict this stuff? Like I said, 20 years ago, when everybody was worried about the internet, they never predicted many of the problems I've described. Um, the best thing about history is its ability to surprise us. Unfortunately, most surprises right. are bad, but maybe that you know, who knows? Maybe ten years from now, they're going to look. They're going to someone's going to stumble on this podcast and say that I'm a complete pessimist because we're in some new golden age of journalism. I don't know. It could happen. I doubt it. As, as Yogi Berra said, prediction is hard, especially about the future. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Uh, Jonathan Kay, thanks again for your time. I really appreciate uh, uh, you, you, you taking the time to speak with me. This has been a great conversation. I've really, I've really enjoyed speaking with you. Thanks. That was fun. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. Links related to today's discussion can be found in the show notes. If you enjoyed today's show, please subscribe and engage in the conversation. Comment, rate, and review. We'd love to hear your take on things. The podcast for Inquiry is brought to you by the Centre for Inquiry Canada. We rely entirely on donations to be your voice supporting science, free inquiry, critical thinking, and secularism here in Canada. To our supporters, thank you. If you have not yet contributed to CFIC, please consider making a donation at centreforinquiry.ca slash donate or becoming a member for only $30 per year at centerforinquiry.ca slash join. Your support makes it possible for us to continue making our collective demand for reason and evidence-based decision-making everywhere. Find us on Facebook and follow CFIC on Twitter at CFI Canada. See you next time.